Each of these handmade dioramas tells a story. These interwoven tales form the narrative tapestry of Aegis, my original world. The subject of today's diorama hails from the Gibra Enclave, a secretive underground faction of marauders. I'll show you how I conceptualized, built, and painted this diorama, and we'll finish with a short story. This is Gamey Builds, and welcome to Beyond the Blight. A few months ago, Bill from Bill Making Stuff invited me to join his Big Bot Bash challenge. The idea was to kit bash an original robot with a 20-sided die determining all of its attributes. The attributes I rolled were difficult enough, but Bill also had the added stipulation that 3D printing wasn't allowed, meaning that I would need to kit bash and scratch build this entire thing. To help grease the creative cogs, I finally opened this box from eBay that had been sitting in a corner collecting dust for months. The huge lot of plastic model aircraft it contained would serve some inspiration, but the real challenge here was getting all these attributes in while also creating a cohesive design that would fit in my universe. After a lot more combing through supplies and old toys, an idea began to form. I began blocking the mecha out in Blender. Modeling in 3D is helpful for visualizing how it all comes together, but it's also a useful aid for people like me who aren't great at perspective drawing and need a solid reference to draw from. As I've stated numerous times before, these quiet periods of conceptualizing help me concentrate on how the build will fit into the rest of the world, and specifically on the story behind the diorama. As I announced last June, I'm currently working on my first full-length Beyond the Blight novel. This standalone story will have references to the builds and short stories in the videos, but my aim is to write a story that doesn't require any previous knowledge of my world to enjoy. While it's proved to be an enormous challenge, I'm about three-fourths of the way through the first draft, and I'm pleased with how it's shaping up. While the novel will be available in ebook, audiobook, and paperback formats, I'm also considering selling a limited number of signed hardcover copies, so if that sounds like something you'd be willing to support, please let me know in the comments. With the line work finished, I colored everything in watercolors. Until now, I've been very wary of painting a mech black, which can be a difficult color to work with. However, I felt that this gave it a very menacing appearance, which tied in nicely with the evil attribute I rolled. It also makes sense in the context of the mech's usage, which we'll get to soon. And with a satisfying concept that checked the attribute boxes for the challenge, it was on to building. When I first rolled bean pole for a body attribute, I envisioned something tall and thin, which helped to inspire this vertical wing concept. Of course, for this to work, the wing would need something stable to mount it to, so I chose this airplane fuselage. In the past, I would have made these cuts with a rotary tool, but a jeweler's saw has a much finer blade, allowing for cleaner, more precise cuts. And a sanding block helped to even out any remaining irregularities. I've been asked multiple times where I get my thin nozzle superglue from. The superglue itself is nothing special, just something I purchased from my local dollar store, and the thin nozzles were purchased in a pack of 100 some years ago. To attach the nozzle, I first slice off about a centimeter of the back end. I then remove the original superglue nozzle and add a fine coat of UV resin to all of the edges, being careful not to get any in the hole. The thin nozzle is then slipped on tightly, and I quickly cure it with a UV light. This creates a perfect seal and really stretches my superglue usage. But the real benefit here is that I can get into very small spaces and apply accurately. With the lower body done and the wing halves glued and sanded, I drilled holes into the end and added these brass prongs with Gorilla Glue. I then sliced a piece of XPS foam to fit inside the lower body, 
and give those wing prongs something to really bite into. Once the foam was carved down to fit the form of the body, I hot glued the prongs into place, then filled the gaps with aluminum foil and a top layer of epoxy sculpt. This gave me a clean surface to start attaching Greeblies to, and most of those came from this huge junk lot of Gundam parts, also purchased on eBay. After a couple of years of kit bashing, I've used many of these same bits again and again, and if I'm being honest, I have to say that I'm getting a little tired of the aesthetic, and I'm looking to expand into other types of parts. So if you've got any recommendations, I'd love to hear them in the comments. You'll also notice that I'm using a lot of epoxy sculpt to add these bits onto the main body. While this provides a snug, sure fit, it's good to keep in mind that epoxy putty isn't really meant to be in a fixative. So the pieces often need to be removed after the epoxy hardens so that they can be properly attached with superglue. For the hole at the rear of the craft, I traced out the shape onto paper, then used the paper to make a template from styrene. I also added a hole to the center to allow for the rear thruster to be held snugly in place. And using the same method as before, I attached the body onto this frame, taken from a Final Faction toy. I drilled holes in four places, then added tiny lengths of paper clips, beads, and other bits to suggest the existence of mechanisms to which the legs would attach. For the little tanks and panel part here, I hacked up this plastic toy and took what I needed, and was quite surprised to find that not only was this thing 3D printed, but the resin inside was still wet. Yikes. And after the addition of these exhaust funnels, it was time to get started on the legs. Organization is probably one of the least talked about parts of kit bashing, but for me, it's also one of the most essential, allowing me to quickly track down very specific parts. In this case, a bunch of long, rigid pieces for the legs. Pen caps made for satisfactory hip joints, and these were connected to lengths of styrene tubes, then sawed down. Halves of Gundam shoulder joints help bulk out the shape of the hips, and adding this epoxy sculpt allowed me to blend the caps into the tubes with slightly more fluid lines. For a little more visual interest, I also mixed up some green stuff epoxy putty and added this rubber seal to the edge of the hip panels. More styrene tubes were used to create the middle leg sections, but here I ran into a big problem. I only had two of these model airplane landing gear parts for the leg joints, and I needed four. Since 3D printing wasn't allowed for this build, I had no idea what to do. After racking my brains a bit, I decided to try molding my own pieces. About a year ago, another YouTube model maker, BP Custom Creations, sent me this Oyumaru. It was only after turning it into some funky fungi that I realized that this material is actually used by hobbyists to cast their own model parts. After warming it up in a cup of near boiling water, I flattened out chunks of the Oyumaru, also known as blue stuff, then imprinted it with the pieces. I then removed those pieces and pressed in some green stuff. I was very skeptical about the end result, but after a day of hardening and a bit of trimming with an X-Acto blade, I was impressed. I next attached the upper and middle leg segments using beads and armature wire, and these rubber boot joints sculpted from green stuff helped fix the pose and made for strong connections. Then came the lower leg segments, and finally, these Gundam bits were filled in with epoxy sculpt, fitted with yet more airplane pieces, then attached to the rest of the legs. These bits, also originally landing gear parts, help to strengthen the joints and make the final model much more stable. Finally, green stuff was added to the hip connections and sculpted for a snug fit, although the legs wouldn't be glued until the very end. It's been a few months since I stumbled upon this Final Faction toy, which immediately grabbed my attention for its awesome set of robotic legs, wires included. As I've said before though, the only problem with cheap toys is the soft, rubbery plastic. It took quite some time, even with a heat gun, to repose one of the arms, which wanted to keep returning to the original shape. 
I eventually got it to kind of stay in position, then trimmed off part of it to add these Gundam hands. Finally, I drilled into the shoulder joints, allowing me to connect the two arms to an axle like so. These mecha units are called Pash Fis, or Dark Knives, which they resemble while flying through space. Their collapsible legs and thin profiles allow them to glide up alongside unsuspecting ships in space. Once they attach to the ship's hull, they puncture the hull using a pulse cutter, which punches tiny holes into a section of a ship to depressurize it. Once depressurized, the mecha slices an opening in the hull, allowing the chunk to be knocked out as a small team of pirates in Atmo suits clamber aboard to commandeer the vessel. To create the spiky mecha head, I co-opted this Gundam bit, then built it up section by section, first using styrene, then some green stuff. I then added prongs and various 135th scale weaponry to achieve the spiky aesthetic. More Gundam bits helped to round out the head's shape to create a more natural transition to the body. And lastly, epoxy sculpt was used to fuse the head onto the rest of the body. Scattered among the bags of model junk I've recently purchased, I discovered pieces to this rolling ladder, which I thought would be a great addition to the scene. I've been trying to include more human figures in my dioramas. I find they really breathe life into a scene and bring a sense of scale to the mechas, making them look less toy-like. Over the last few years of buying model junk grab bags, I've accumulated quite a few 135th scale figures, and since many of them come in separate body parts, I can mix and match to create unique poses that help to set the scene. Since I'd already mixed up some green stuff for the figures, I decided to experiment with a new technique for making textured cables. In Blender, I modeled these grooved panels, then printed two sets at different sizes. After rolling out long strings of green stuff, I used the panels to roll the cables, creating a nice grooved texture. I've used many techniques for cables and wires in the past two years, but green stuff creates one of my favorite looks to date, especially with this added texture. Now, I wasn't too confident that my spindly stick legs would hold up the weight of the walker, so I decided to add a thick fuel hose to the underside for some extra support. To craft it, I heated up this 2mm acrylic rod, which basically turned it into a wet plastic noodle. This allowed me to then easily bend and form the rod before it eventually cooled and hardened. For added texture, I slipped on some heat shrink tubing. As usual, I dropped by the dollar store for a cheap decorative frame for this diorama's base. I went for something with a bit of depth here, as I decided at the last minute that I wanted a grating in the floor to reveal a nest of pipes and wires beneath. Once it was cleaned up, I mapped out the wiring for some LED lights, then sawed a tiny hole for this 9-volt battery. A giant hole was then drilled in the side of the frame for the on-off switch, and I superglued it into position and soldered it to the battery, then the resistor. If I can pat my own back here for a sec, I'm super happy that I've slowly improved at wiring these LED circuits, which for a long time was my biggest weakness when building dioramas. Even when dealing with super fiddly components like these cheap LED filaments that kept breaking on me whenever I touched them, I powered through, pun intended. I went through four of these lights just for this project, and after this final attempt, I decided to just live with it. The pipes and wiring beneath the floor were a combination of bendy straws, plastic tubes, acrylic rods, and yes, a few leftover 3D prints from previous projects. But since they weren't used to make the bot, nor were they designed specifically for this project, I felt that using them was equivalent to kit bashing. With everything in place, I glued down some chipboard to give a little more height under the floor, then got working on the flooring itself. This was designed digitally, then cut from a 2mm sheet of pine wood. To the underside, I glued on some wire mesh from an old grease screen, then glued that to the base. 
Now it was on to the painting. And to assist me, the good people at AK Interactive sent me this awesome box of effect paints. And you'll get to see a few of them in action in just a moment. My friends at Artify also sent this beautiful set of miniature paintbrushes, which took a beating with this project and held up perfectly. You can find links to all these products in the video description. Dear Ma, I'm writing this letter from beneath about 50 meters of solid rock, buttressed by rusty steel girders that climb up so high our light beams can't reach the top. Not that I'd want to see what's up there anyways. The girders double as elevator columns so that whatever craft the mechanics are working on down here can be raised to the surface, secretly loaded onto waiting ships and deployed wherever the Enclave wills. I suppose this is where I say you were right, Ma. Never should have taken those runs with the Red Wing. That's what got me into this mess. That's what's got me burrowing underground like a rock mole hiding from the light. Hiding from the eyes in the sky. We're gonna fix it though, Ma. The commander's got a plan. We're gonna get this snatch in orbital station. It's not a foolproof plan, of course. I don't expect even half of us to make it back alive, but there's a chance. Orbital stations aren't armed to the teeth, not like Royal Cruisers or Corvettes, but they've got needle cannons running on mag rails all the same, roving circuits like patrol drones, and they will fire at just about anything that glistens. Twinkle, twinkle, slice. They aren't your regular needlers either. These cannons fire 20 centimeter sharpened steel spikes, designed specifically to pierce Atmo suits. They so much as nick your suit and it's good night, Gibra. They won't do much to the hull of a ship, but that's fine. No one wants ship to ship combat in orbit these days. There's too much debris hurtling around already, and plus it's so wasteful. Why destroy a good ship when you can punch a hole in its side, slip right on in, and make yourself at home? And that's our plan, more or less. These dark knives are a thing of beauty, Ma. And you'd be impressed if you could see me, latched onto the side with my mag grapple and harness as it folds up like a cave spider and corkscrews through the dark towards an enemy ship. Landing on the hull is the hardest bit, if you can make it that far. The impact is so strong that your whole body is flung forward onto the enemy craft. You've got to time it just right, ungrappling from the dark knife no less than 20 meters before impact so you can blast the reverse jets on your pack to slow yourself, then mag grapple onto the target's hull. Maybe you catch, maybe you don't. The ones that don't tumble off the hull and hurtle into the great nothingness of the void. Velocity constant, destination unknown. Sons of the universe, we call them. But I digress, back to the orbital station. Commander says there's one up there that's mostly malfunctioning, one of the oldest in operation, original Corsecki and showing its age. Half the needle cannons are iced over, and the other half are running on rails that haven't been serviced in decades. It's basically defenseless, except for the security automeca that's likely on board, that is. The plan is to climb aboard, disable whatever defenses are still around, let the dark knife do its dirty work cutting open the hull, then slip in and commandeer the station. And by commandeer, we mean take it over long enough to ransom it back to the Empire, or else set it on a collision course for the planet's surface. If it comes to the latter, then we pull a maneuver some of the veterans call skeeling. You buckle in, ride the station through the atmosphere in a blazing ball of fire, then bail once the air resistance slows it enough for a skywalk. We've got parachutes beneath our propulsion jets, so it's feasible that we could land safely somewhere back on the planet and survive, but <laughs> I'm not putting my money on it. No, best chance for survival is that the royals pay the ransom and we hop back on the dark knife and head off on our merry way, only much, much richer. And here's the kicker. We get paid even if we don't make it back. The ings are forwarded to whoever we left it to in our contracts under the clause, in case of fatality. Pretty nifty, huh, Ma? 
In case you haven't pieced it together, you're the one in my claws. I know you've had a rough go of it, and maybe this will help. Maybe you can put it toward Heg. And in spite of everything, I miss my little brother. Sign him up for the Royal Youth Brigade or something. Keep him out of trouble. Keep him out of, well, this. Thing is, you'll only get this letter if I don't make it back alive. It'll arrive with my forwarded payment. Bittersweet, huh? Love, your son, Kelka. so much for watching. Remember to let me know what you all think about a signed hardcover version of my upcoming novel, or really commenting anything else that strikes your fancy. And of course, an enormous thanks to Bill Making Stuff for inviting me to join his challenge. And be sure to check out the other entries in the Big Bot Bash Challenge. That's all for now. This is Gamey Builds. Over and out. I got my Xbox, you can't play me. Money in a text box, I get paid. You know?